Good afternoon. On behalf of Pulvermacher, Kennedy and Associates, Alan Norton and Blue, RBB Communications and MBAF, we'd like to welcome you to our webinar on a roadmap to successfully reopening your business. I'd like to address the format of today's 60 minute presentation with you. All of you have been placed on mute for the duration of the presentation. The presentation is being recorded and will be available to you shortly after today. We have four panelists that will share their thoughts with you about a roadmap for reopening your business. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat button and write to the panelists. We have set aside some time at the end for questions and answers and thank those participants that sent in questions before today. We'll attempt to answer as many of these questions as we can at the end of the presentation. The questions that we do not address will be answered in an FAQ that will be provided to you when we send out a copy of the presentation. During the presentation, you will also be given several polling questions and asked that you respond to them. Finally, on behalf of the presenters and our firms today, we thank you for your patience in advance for any technology delays that we may experience due to circumstances outside of our control. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to present today's distinguished panelists in the order of our roadmap. Dr. Jerry Pulvermacher will be speaking with us about the emotional and interpersonal factors with returning to work. Jerry is senior partner at Pulvermacher Kennedy and Associates and is an organizational psychologist. PKA specializes in providing advisory services to senior most executives and executive teams in order to enhance organizational performance. He has worked on projects to refresh corporate strategy, implement transformational change and in strategic initiatives, succession planning, developing stronger executive teams, and enhancing individual performance. His experience includes a deep understanding of organizations within professional services, financial services, manufacturing, consumer business, real estate, healthcare, and lottery and gaming. Prior to founding PKA, Jerry was a global par partner and service line leader at Deloitte Consulting. Marai Leal will then share her insights and experience on people planning and HR considerations with returning to work. With more than 20 years of experience in human resources and professional development, Marai has become the Director of Human Resources at MBAF. Her responsibilities include professional development, performance management, compensation and benefits, and employee relations. In addition, she see, oversees recruitment and employee retention efforts in order to attract and retain talent across all offices. Prior to joining MBAF, Marai served as the Human Resources Director for multiple organizations in various industries, including technology, healthcare, hospitality, and others. Susan Potter Norton follows Marae and will be speaking about the legal aspects of returning to work post coronavirus. Susan is a shareholder to Allen Norton and Blue PA and is board certified in labor and employment law and has over 40 years of experience representing public and private employers. She was currently co chair of the ABA section of litigation professional development committee and the past co chair of the ABA section of litigation labor employment committee. Susan's a frequent lecturer for the ABA section of litigation professional development, as well as other webinars, including the Florida bar. Laura Guitar rounds out our panel by speaking to us about business communications relating to reopening your post-corona business. Laura serves as the lead of Reputation and Risk Advisors, RBB's Crisis Communications and Issues Management Division. With more than 20 years of experience, Laura's cross-industry experience includes strategic communications, programming to develop and lease crisis response, identifying and managing issue-based risk, and establishing advocacy and stakeholder support in all of Florida's major metro markets. Laura's background includes work for national and international corporate enterprises across a wide range of industries. And I am Marta Alfonso, the head of the litigation practice for MBAF and your moderators for today's panel. And with those introductions completed, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jerry. Thank you, thank you, Marta, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. So before we get started into the um, body of my presentation, I want to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, uh, the reactions to returning to the workplace, uh, they're likely to be all over the map for people. 
Uh, some will come in extremely fearful and uh, with some degree of trepidation. Uh, others will be really quite ecstatic about the opportunity to get uh, back out of the house and uh, sheltering and being back in, in a situation where they can be with other people. So it's hard to sort of stereotype and say that everybody's going to react in a very predictable and consistent way. And as I'll mention later on as well, even those people who come into the workplace with a certain mindset and a certain emotional reaction to begin with, that too can vacillate over time. So uh, the purpose of my presentation essentially then is to acquaint you with what are the range of possibilities of how people are going to react or could be reacting when they come back to work, uh, help those who are managers to recognize uh, what are some signs or signals that somebody may be struggling and what are some things a manager can do to assist those people who may be struggling in some fashion and what uh, individuals can actually do for themselves uh, when when they experience the emotional and sometimes behavioral reactions that could be associated with returning to work so if we have a first slide the, uh, the very interesting study that just came out, it was done, uh, a survey was given to 36,000 professionals in Ontario, Canada, and of those 36,000, 1,600 people responded. About two-thirds were women, uh, a third men, and then you'll see on the screen the various age ranges, and these were questions regarding, uh, that were asked to, or posed to these uh, people being surveyed between the weeks of the between the days of April 25th to May the 3rd so it's not that long ago uh, about their emotional status with respect to returning to work so can you have the next slide please and here are the responses they essentially fell into about five different categories but you'll notice between fear anxiety and uncertainty 57 percent of the people had some sort of untoward uh, reaction to the notion of going back to work Whereas uh, something in the order of about 40% uh, were either joyful, excited, or somewhat neutral. Uh, women in this study, and I'm not going to get into a gender differences per se, but women, women uh, express more uncertainty and fear than men, as you see, 61 to 7, 47%. And men seem to report, although not, not at very high levels, men reported uh, more excitement and joy than women did about returning to work. But there was a small number nonetheless. Next slide, please. So the, um, the obvious notion to understand is that everyone, including the manager, is going to react differently to returning to work. Uh, so for example, if you're an introvert, and introverts by nature tend to be a bit more anxious or have various thoughts about what it could be like to go back to work more so than extroverts, who will be more sort of out there and, and getting things done, are likely to be a bit more worried uh, than the extrovert. Those with children at home um, may, may have a very different reaction if they're concerned about being, uh, how the kids are doing, uh, may be distracted by the fact that they have to check in with the kids that they are at home, are gonna have a little more difficult time than those who don't have children. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a single individual and you've been cooped up for quite some time and, and now you have an opportunity to go back to work and be with colleagues and the like, the experience might be very different for you. But as I make in the next point, uh, the emotions do vacillate. And so someone who may come in very excited and they happen to notice other people not adhering to protocol on safety measures, all of a sudden those who are excited are now going to become anxious and those who are initially fearful over time may get more comfortable uh, if in point of fact people are responding and handling themselves in an appropriate fashion. So it's again, it's very difficult to stereotype that people will remain in a constant state of modality uh, of how they feel. These things do vacillate. And so as a manager, uh, you want to be aware that uh, people's emotions will go up or down depending on circumstances that they encounter. So to say that there's a normal way is very, very difficult, is not yet normal. And that's something to keep in mind. And there are things that managers need to recognize and they need to understand that they can, uh, that can, they can do to assist people in the reboarding process and to facilitate them doing so in a much more comfortable way. Um, and there's similarly, there are things that, as I mentioned earlier on, there are things that the employee can do for themselves. And those are the sorts of things that we're gonna be talking about shortly. So how you can help others and how you can help yourself. But if you give me the next slide, what essentially we've been going through in, in, in terms of 
the, the COVID-19 situation is that everybody to some degree or another is going through some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm sure many of you, if not most of you have heard of this term, but uh, let me define it for you. In the post-traumatic stress disorder is an anxiety disorder that can occur after a person has been through a traumatic event. Now, we're not yet quite through a traumatic event, and in point of fact, there may be more spikes, in which case this, there can be a recurrence. But during a traumatic event, people believe, defining a traumatic event, people believe that their life or the lives of others are in danger. And in this case, it's absolutely a real, uh, a real phenomenon. So it's not an imagined uh, situation, it's a real situation. Uh, and they may feel both fearful and that they're, they have no control over what is happening. And uh, we all know that that's in fact the case that being exposed is the, the only, being exposed or reducing exposure about the only thing you can do to control the situation. But nonetheless, uh, there's this fear that one is not in control. And certainly that feeling of lack of control and certainty and fear when in a post-traumatic stress disorder can balloon into confusion, challenges with memory, and various kinds of intense emotions. Have the next slide, please. So what are some of the signs of post-traumatic stress disorder likely associated with the uh, COVID-19 era? Uh, acting or feeling as though the traumatic event will be happening again. Um, and in this case, it actually may happen again as, as uh, uh, the world opens up, uh, people are running various risks that they weren't, they're being more, much more cautious about before, uh, but feeling that, that the trauma just isn't going away, that it's like, it, can, it can recur. Being physically responsive, such as experiencing a surge in heart rate or sweating, or what we refer to as autonomic nervous system reaction. This is uh, akin to you working out, in a, you're, you're going through a heavy de degree of workout and you're experiencing the increase in blood pressure, heart rate, and so forth. But when people are experiencing anxiety, uh, this, these kinds of reactions can also occur. Uh, furthermore, they can have, people can have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. They become more irritable or having outbursts of anger. Uh, what occurred to me is, uh, and in fact, I actually witnessed this, is you have the elevators in various buildings will say things to the effect of only one or two people on an elevator at a time, and depending, of course, on the size of the elevator, and lo and behold, somebody steps in and breaks the rules, so to speak, uh, and you'll, and you'll get, see people having very visible reactions, visceral reactions, to seeing these, and whereas before they might have kept their emotions to themselves, there's a possibility they could actually act out. Um, and that's an, not inconsistent with someone who's experiencing high degrees of anxiety associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. Feeling like danger is lurking around every corner or mask. And uh, that's my sort of, sort of addition I put in there, the, the mask piece. But nonetheless, I think the, the point is clear that uh, there is this ongoing sense of danger. And yet there are some people who in coping with the anxiety, they get into a state of denial and they act as if nothing much is going on. And, and as a result, they may actually uh, put themselves at risk and other people at risk by doing that. But nonetheless, it's a coping strategy and it's something a manager needs to be aware of. Uh, and that being nonchalant about this doesn't mean to say that they're not experiencing a degree of anxiety. And this is simply how they're coping, albeit uh, possibly self or other defeating. Uh, a loss of interest in important ones, positive activities. And we're gonna talk in a few moments about various degrees of sadness or depression associated with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And in general, experiencing difficulty of having positive feelings such as happiness, love, or more a sense of trepidation. Next slide, please. So what is anxiety and fear? Well, by definition, a fear of phobia is an irrational fear. That's having a fear of something that really can't do harm or danger. But in this case, we are constantly being told that the danger of COVID-19 is anything but irrational. So people's fears are in fact uh, actual uh, things that people should be afraid of. And in some degree, fear here is a, is a useful uh, emotion to have since it gets you to be a bit more cautious. But therefore, in, 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 in this case though, those who are experiencing high levels of anxiety are in essence, as I mentioned, in a normal state and fear can, can in fact be quite helpful, is neither irrational nor a sign of weakness. And I think there'll be some people who will come to the workplace uh, 
who will try to hide, if you will, their, their anxiety or apprehension. And I think it's important, which we'll talk about in a couple of moments, uh, about is the importance of acknowledging that it's okay to feel a particular way. Uh, there's no need to hide it. Uh, and by virtue of trying to suppress it, you actually make the individual makes themselves even more anxious. That said, those folks who are generally anxious by nature uh, will likely be even more apprehensive than normal. And we all know there's the folks that they, we all suffer from different degrees of anxiety, but if you're layering on uh, fear on top of more anxiety, of course, the situation will heighten. And what about those who are in denial? Well, we talked about that already, that the risk of denial, which is in fact a coping strategy, uh, is that people will uh, put themselves in harm's way or possibly others if they engage in denial, when in point of fact, they ought to be much more cautious or careful. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting one as it relates to post-traumatic stress. And, uh, whether or not it's when you, we've been isolating ourselves from other people in general, and now here we're going back to work and uh, there's a sense of maybe it's gonna be you know, interactions as usual, but in point of fact, there are gonna be all kinds of signs of indicators of, re of remaining apart from one another, whether it's uh, plexiglass barriers or circles on the ground or lines that you have to stand behind. And so individuals are gonna to continue to distance each other from one another. And we know that for many people, physical proximity, uh, physical connection are very important. And so those individuals for, who are the kinds of folks who are sort of more, of it, more the type who like to interact and be more close to other individuals are still gonna be quite frustrated. And this can cause a major degree of disappointment and sadness, uh, particularly amongst those people. Some of you, I'm sure many of you have to take this, this test called the Myers-Briggs and they talk about feelers and thinkers. Well, people are more the feeling type are individuals who, more, who are more gregarious and who are more out there and, uh, and they're gonna feel quite frustrated and sad of, and disappointed uh, that even though they're back at work and dealing with colleagues, they have to do so at a distance. So another indication or sign of post-traumatic stress is this degree of de dejection. I wouldn't call it outright depression per se, but certainly a sense of dejection would be uh, visible. Can I have the next slide please? So uh, what can we do to help others uh, or help ourselves uh, as we go back to work and how do we cope with this much more effectively? Well, we know that social support is a, is a very important factor in managing stress and creating support groups in the workplace where people have an opportunity uh, to strategize and share experiences is clearly something a manager can do. In fact, one can even take it to another level where one or two or three individuals can form something that I've labeled a peer coaching network where individuals can get together, of course, at the appropriate distance from one another, but they can get together in peer teams once or twice a week uh, to just talk about what's working for them, what isn't working for them, seek counsel, some coaching from one another with how to cope. So the combination of social support where people have an opportunity to vent, to talk about their experience, but then taking that to another level of these peer coaching networks where people can actually advise and coach and counsel one another uh, can be a very um, important um, uh, activity to engage in, in order to facilitate returning back to work. And this is something managers can try to create. Uh, I think it's important that we might make time for oneself and it's important that managers and you yourselves, uh, if you're coping and having to cope with these e emotions, is to meditate, listen to music, uh, make a contract with yourself to watch the news only once a day. I mean, when you're home and we're all watching the news time and time again, uh, all it does is enhance anxiety and fear and what have you. So uh, you want to make sure you're not exposing yourself unnecessarily to continuous hammering uh, of these kinds of messages, um, which uh, simply reinforces the anxiety. Uh, we know that physical fitness is really very important as a way of managing the stress. So you don't have to have a gym and some gyms aren't even open. Uh, but when you're walking, even during the workday, if you take some time out, uh, walking is important, swimming, cycling, these are things that don't require a gym, and yet they're things that we can do, you know, both during and after, or even before work, that I think will help to, you know, minimize your susceptibility to undue levels of stress, because you're now controlling your own, own emotional reactions. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
minimize, this is really, I can't under, uh, overemphasize the importance of minimizing alcohol and other uh, substance of, um, uses of substances. Now, to some extent, I'm not advocating you don't have a drink or something like that, uh, but the, you've got to be careful because if, if you're going to use uh, these kinds of substances as a way of helping you cope uh, with, with this transition back into the workplace and you're using it to extreme, you know, over time, you'll, you'll be fine with the, uh, with the transition, but you're left with another problem because you've been abusing the, the substances and uh, ultimately become self-defeating because they can become habitual, uh, especially if you're already prone to, you know, this, this, this kind of uh, uh, consumption. I think it's really important that you be mindful uh, that you can get yourself into trouble long-term if you tend to use these uh, methods as a way of coping. Um, Adjusting your expectations of self and others. You know, if you, the type A individuals are used to having everything done very quickly, they're impatient. And usually it works to their advantage because they can uh, do, they can multitask, they can do a lot of things at the same time, and they pride themselves on getting things done in a very timely fashion. Well, the conditions are not normal and people are going to be a bit slower and information is going to flow a lot more slowly. So you got to adjust your expectations of yourself and other people. Uh, also, if you're a perfectionist, perfectionists expect extremely high standards of themselves and others and resources may not be as readily available to you and information may not be as readily available and people may just be a bit slower because they, they're trying to balance things with work at home, with kids at home and the like. I think if you don't adjust your expectations, you're setting yourself up. Up, uh, for disappointment and frustration and anger. So just be aware uh, uh, that these th there are these changes and um, it's important to be cognizant of that. Uh, and the also another personality, personality trait that I think is important to be aware of is if you're one of these individuals has a high need to control, um, this is something you've got to also be aware that you're not really as much control. All you can really do nowadays is really control yourself. You can help and advise other people, but all you can do is control your own reactions. And interestingly, by virtue of controlling your own reactions, you're in a much better position to model as a manager uh, or a colleague is to model and help other people by trying to stay in control and, and uh, doing what it takes to manage your own emotions. And finally, uh, if, if this is all get, is this is all too difficult, and it can be for some people, um, many organizations do have EAP providers, and uh, I know that the counselors on these EAP uh, uh, programs are, are schooled in helping individuals cope with this current crisis. Uh, they talk about it with one another extensively and have strategies to help if it's at a deeper level. And, uh, hopefully, and if that isn't sufficient, well, then hopefully you can find a psychologist or psychiatrist who deals with stress management and jokingly and who isn't freaked out themselves. Thank you very much. And I'll pass it on to Martha. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing with us this interesting research on employee reactions to the pandemic your observations about emotional responses and your recommendations to managers and employers on how to manage through these issues. Armed with that information, we turn to the next part of our roadmap, which involves Marai's discussions about the role that people playing takes in being ready to reopen. Thank you, Marta. So when reopening businesses, it's important to plan on how to bring your employees back. Um, in this portion of the presentation, we're going to go over the office readiness essentials of every aspect you'll need to cover in order to be ready to reopen your business. And that entails preparing the building, preparing the workforce, control access, develop social distancing plan, minimize touch points and increase cleaning, and finally communications. Next slide. So there's three main factors that we'll need to consider. And these main factors are community readiness, facility readiness, and employee readiness. Community readiness is basically all the external factors that will impact um, as part of the planning process. Therefore, governmental orders have been lifted or not, the trajectory of the virus, whether or not you can access hand sanitizers, wipes, and PPE in general for the organization. The second aspect to consider is the facility readiness. It's important to look at space planning and evaluate to ensure social distancing, as well as establish cleaning protocols, um, having the proper supplies available, as well as employee instructional signage 
to ensure directional instruction in terms of limiting social distancing. And then, of course, establishing uh, protocols with the building or landlord of where your offices reside. It's important to take these factors into consideration. And then one piece that I think is most crucial is the employee readiness piece. You must consider various options on how you're going to bring your employees back into the office like, for example, the essential employees first or establish staggered office schedules or have a work from home rotation schedule, as well as considerations of the employees that are at risk. Next slide. So in order to do so, setting up a task force should involve representation of various offices and departments. You must define a plan with initiatives taking into account the three main factors previously discussed. This task force should meet regularly to discuss updates and determine action items leading up to the reopening. As we can discuss in the next slide, creating a project plan and establishing initiatives is crucial. The first step is to establish a target reopening date. When you're establishing the reopening date, um, you must determine what approach is best in regards to bringing employees back into the office. Note that all decisions must be made in a non-discriminatory manner, which Susan will discuss later on in the presentation. By conducting a survey to determine employees' readiness, this will assist in conducting an impact analysis, which will be a good indicator on how to proceed. If you have several offices, you must take into account that the offices may not all open at the same target date due to lockdown orders by county or state, or they may have different challenges like mass transit issues. So you cannot necessarily take a cookie cutter approach when opening, uh, reopening your offices. Um, as you can see in the next slide, it's important to create a timeline and working backwards from the reopening date is extremely useful, as this will keep you on target with the various actionable steps along the way. The next aspect that must be taken into account will be discussed in the next slide, which in essence, it's policies and procedures. Next slide. From an HR perspective, it is important to take the time now to review and update any policies and procedures. It is important to setting expectations and communicating them ahead of time. This will help ease anxiety. For example, what is to be expected as an employee on day one? Developing frequently asked questions for employees, answering a lot of their concerns and sending these frequently asked questions along with a reopening communication ahead of time may also help minimize the anxiety as previously previously discussed with Jerry's presentation. It is important to also establish visitor and client protocols and to communicate them ahead of time. Establishing cleaning protocols and sharing them with cleaning staff or third party janitorial services to ensure that they're meeting CDC guidelines in terms of cleaning. Also establishing testing protocols. What kind of equipment will you use? Will you require self checks? If so, will you require them to monitor it? Um, and then finally, communication. It is important to be flexible, keeping in mind that as employers are going through the stressors of reopening, employees are also stressing. They're stressing about childcare, about whether or not their partner has been unemployed or laid off. And, you know, we have to take into account potentially making reasonable accommodations for these folks. In the next slide, we'll touch upon additional considerations. So in essence, it is important to take into account that not only are we focusing on the workforce management and customer management, but we also need to give a greater focus to the wellness management. Remember, beyond the visible, you must be sensitive to the invisible when we're dealing with people. Again, we have to be open and flexible when dealing with unforeseen events. It's important to engage our stakeholders when making decisions and obtaining feedback as you go through this process. And then when implementing changes, make sure to avoid short-term uh, policies or procedures um, and try to establish uh, 
policies and processes that are seen more so for the future. Next slide, please. Communicating thoughtfully and clearly is instrumental. And Laura will discuss later on in the presentation a bit more about communications. We need to show empathy and patience with our employees. Provide management training to reinforce those managers and their skill sets when it pertains to managing with stress, managing remote workers, or becoming better active listeners. In our next slide, I'd like to recap. So when we prepare the building, we have to establish cleaning plans, train our cleaning staff, provide them with the expectations. Also discuss with the building management what is required of their guidelines uh, for, to be able to communicate to the employees. Preparing the workforce, obviously trying to mitigate anxiety, having a plan for deciding who returns, um, who is um, providing proper communication, that is key throughout this process. And then controlling access, setting protocols for safety and health checks, establishing guidelines around the building reception and security, shipping, receiving, elevator rides, as well as establishing visitor and client policies is also very important. Then of course, creating a social distancing plan, Decreasing density by space planning, considering staggered schedules, as well as establishing office traffic patterns. Then reducing touch points and increasing cleaning. Maybe having open doors that minimizes touch points. Having a clean desk policy. Having cleaning common areas. How frequently do you want to clean them? Restricting break rooms for a period of time. And then finally communication. Recognizing that the, there is fear about returning, how to communicate transparently, and then of course, listen and survey regularly. Thank you. Mariah, we're grateful for the numerous ideas and tips about how to project plan, sequence, and organize the people side of a business to be ready for reopening. The next aspect of our roadmap involves making sure that we have considered the legal aspects of opening the business in a post-coronavirus world. Susan will now discuss the legal framework that an employer should use in making policy and process decisions for opening. Thank you, Martha. Next slide, please. The main points I want to consider today are how do you recall employees, changes in terms and conditions of employment, safety concern, the wearing of masks and face coverings, what to do when employee tests positive, how to handle reluctant and or high risk employees, and some final thoughts. Next slide, please. Okay, recalling employees. Um, you have to do this. If you have a collective bargaining agreement, if you're unionized, then it's simple. You're gonna follow the collective bargaining agreement. Absent that, however, you have to be sure you use job-related criteria in other words, it needs to be in a non-discriminatory method. There is a high correlation between unemployment and large number of charges of unlawful discrimination. In fact, 2010-2011 was one of the highest unemployment rates until now, and EEOC had the most number of charges filed during that. So it is particularly important that you have a decision or a method that is defensible. Seniority is an excellent method, of course. Um, it is gender, race neutral. However, it doesn't always fit the business needs. So then you need to look at other job-related criteria, such as attendance records. So long as it's not a protected leave, like under FMLA or the Family First uh, Corona's Response Act, you're okay in using attendance. Um, discipline records, again, as long as it's documented discipline, then you can use that. You can use production or sales. Um, that's another uh, job-related criteria that is non-discriminatory. I would caution you against using any non-documented perception because they're usually subject to successful challenge. Next slide, please. You may have already instituted or you may wish to institute uh, changes in compensation. Again, absent a collective bargaining agreement or an employment contract, employers can change an employee's pay. Employers must tell the employees before the employee starts working 
if the employer is reducing the wages. Many states require notice to be in writing, and some require it to be a pay period in advance. Regardless if it's required, we strongly recommend that written notice be given. Next slide, please. There may also be changes in the schedules. Now, if you're considering a reduction in hours, remember that an exempt employee must be paid a salary of at least $684 for any and all hours they work in any week. Therefore, we do not recommend that any wage reduction for an exempt person match hours. In other words, you do not use a reduction of hours as a means of reducing a salary. Instead, we recommend that if a salary of an exempt person is being reduced, it's due to economic circumstances, not hours. Also be careful if you decide to add to your exempt um, employees duties that normally an hourly employee would perform because you're cutting back the workforce, you do not want to eliminate the primary responsibility for the exemption. In other words, you don't want the hourly task to override the exempt ones. Um, in terms of reduction of um, hours or in terms of the reduction in salary, one way would be to have the exempt person only work one week on and one week off. That way you don't have to pay the salary for the week they do not work. Um, as with part-time employees, some states pay unemployment. If the hours are reduced, uh, the employee makes less than the unemployment they will receive the difference, and supposedly the $600. Florida recognizes that. Next slide, please. Another concern, of course, is the safety. Um, the EEC, EEOC has issued new guidelines allowing employers to do temperature checks. Now, even though public employers, um, you have the Fourth Amendment and there's no case law, if we look at uh, the fact that you're allowed to drug test individuals in safety-sensitive positions due to the risk that those individuals may pose to others if they are under the influence, I think we can analogize that to a person with uh, the virus. And I think that would present a defense that you are able to take the temperature of individuals in the public sector. Um, but there are pros and cons, um, regardless if it's private or public. If the temperature is recorded, it's a medical record, so it must be kept private and maintained separately from the employee's file. If, on the other hand, it's merely a yes, you pass, or no, you don't, then there's no record. Again, we still have privacy concerns, however, um, if telling someone that they have a fever, which is what the CDC recommends, of higher than 100.4. It may be easier to do it behind a curtain uh, with a doorway that leads to two different areas, and that way individuals standing in line will not know if the person tested positive, or excuse me, tested for a fever or not. Now, if you have a large workforce uh, or any workforce, you have to keep in mind social distancing while the employees are waiting in line. So. That has to be taken into consideration. Um, another consideration is the time waiting compensable. Uh, maybe so. Um, I believe it would not be under federal law and um, using, again, Integrity Solutions versus Bursk, a Supreme Court case from 2014. It most likely would not be because their waiting to have security checks was considered not compensable under federal law. However, you need to check your state and local laws. For example, Nevada, California, Arizona uh, would consider standing in line uh, compensable. Florida does not because Florida follows federal law. I do not believe it would be compensable in Florida law. Finally, who's going to conduct the test? If you have an in-house nurse or the employer contracts with a health provider, fine. But absent that, we would recommend a management official be the designated person. Of course, you have to provide the personal protection equipment for the person taking the temperatures, even with infrared uh, thermometers uh, because of sneezing or coughing. Absolutely have to have a face shield, of course, gloves, uh, and protective clothing that's disposable. You can also test for the coronavirus, but the results will again be a medical record subject to privacy and um, being placed in a separate file than the, than the employee's personnel file. Now, if you're using any test that requires blood or access to blood, then, of course, you have to comply with OSHA's uh, 
requirement on blood uh, borne pathogen training. Next slide, please. So, employers, what can they ask? Um, number one, you can, of course, send out a questionnaire ahead of time. And if it is turned into human resources, it's a medical record. It has to be kept. But employers can ask employees if they're experiencing symptoms of coronavirus. Um, the cough, the fever, shortness of breath, sore throat, unexplained loss of taste, etc. cetera. Um, you can ask if an employee has traveled to or has been with anyone who has traveled to certain uh, states or countries where there's an outbreak in the last 14 days. Um, you can ask the employee to self-check every morning and to complete a self-audit either every morning or before returning to work. What you can't do is you can't ask the individual if there's any underlying conditions that would make them susceptible. Next slide, please. All right, mask and face coverings. What's the difference? Well, a mask is a filtering respirator, such as the N95 we've heard about, or a specialized medical grade or surgical mask. A face covering is just that. It's a cloth that covers the nose and the mouth. And employers can require employees to wear a mask. Again, um, you are subject to state and local requirements, and many are requiring masks. But if, even if they're not, the employer can require it at this particular time. Have a written and posted policy, particularly if individuals are going to be dealing with the public and the uh, uh, current state and or local laws do not require a mask. Um, I would have the signs pro uh, prominently uh, posted so all would see that you have required your employees to have the um, face covering. Now, if an employee objects to wearing a face mask or uh, covering, what do you do? Again, you engage in the interactive uh, process of why. Um, if it's merely because they're obstinate, send them home and tell them they can't, they can't uh, work unless they're not going to wear a mask. However, if it's based on medical reasons, then you need to explore uh, what sort of accommodation. Maybe it's the length of time they're wearing it or the material, et cetera. But you need to explore what can be, uh, how they can be accommodated. It may also be religious reasons. Again, you need to explore an accommodation with them. Next slide, please. So what do you do if an employee tests positive? Uh, first, if they test positive, then you ask them who he or she came in contact with within the last 14 days. Now, if you're, someone is just sick and you don't know if they're testing positive, then uh, the CDC recommends that you ask who they've been in close contact with for the last 48 hours. Second, once you get the names of the individuals that the, that the infected person has been in contact with, um, you advise those individuals in close proximity that a coworker has tested positive. You do not identify the coworker and that they may have been exposed to the virus. Third, you send the individuals home for a 14 days from when they last had contact with the person. So, for example, if the infected individual has been out of work for five days, then those that were in very close proximity would have to wait nine calendar days. Now, if you're a public employer or if you have less 500 or less employees at that time, then the infected individual may be entitled to um, 80 hours paid sick leave under the CARES Act. Additionally, the individuals that are sent home, if they go for testing, they too may be uh, under, entitled to compensation under the CARES Act. Now, depending on the size of your workforce, employees may start guessing who it is, or they may well know just because there's only six people working in the department. Again, you cannot confirm that's the individual and it's protected medical um, information. If you can, wait 24 hours and then disinfect. If you can't wait 24 hours, you wait as long as possible. Uh, it's recommended that disinfecting be done by professional staff. If not, then um, your staff can do it, but they will need uh, personal protection equipment, including uh, disposable gowns. Make sure that everything is disinfected, from sofas to carpets to doorknobs, desks, filing cabinets, bathrooms, etc. copy machines, refrigerators, everything. Um, if it's been more than seven days since the infected person was at work, uh, 
then a routine cleaning is sufficient and disinfectant is not needed. Next slide, please. Okay, so you've decided who you're going to recall and you've sent them letters and advised them of the new terms and conditions of employment and all of a sudden employee A calls you and is afraid to come to work because of his or her underlying health conditions. And employee B doesn't want to return to work because of child care issues. And employee C is concerned that he will bring the virus home to his children or to others who are vulnerable and therefore doesn't want to work. What do you do? Next slide, please. If an employee A is simply afraid to come to work, then that is not uh, compensable or a protected characteristic. However, it's nothing is ever that simple. Uh, if employee A is afraid and it's anxiety, then that can be um, a protected characteristic under the Americans with Disabilities Act, anxiety. On the other hand, if it's due to underlying health conditions, then they are definitely are protected under the Americans uh, uh, Dis Disabilities Act, as well as under many state and local laws. Then you must engage in an interactive process with the employee to explore what accommodations can be provided. Um, if they can work from home, that's obvious. Um, maybe modifying the hours, transferring to a different position or a different location temporarily. If none of that works, explore FMLA options. Um, or leave as an accommodation. Um, you can determine if their health care provider has advised them to self-isolate. Then again, they may be um, entitled, depending on your size or if you're public, to compensation under the CARES Act. At this point in time, and particularly for the first phase and into the second, we recommend flexibility. It's not black and white. Um, we recommend strongly that uh, employers remain flexible and also note that initial refusal or reluctance to return to work and discussion of such um, could be protected under OSHA whistleblower uh, laws. And also, if it's more than one person and they discuss it, you could also be subject to um, protected concerted activity under either the Public Employees Relations Commission um, Act in Florida or the National Labor Relations Act. Um, as well as other state and local governments. And you need to check your state and local government laws. For example, Colorado requires accommodation to this high-risk population and prohibits the employer from compelling them to return to work. Uh, some states and cities also require paid leave under uh, either recent orders in the last 60 days or 90 days or established um, paid sick and safe time. Again, Colorado, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Washington, et cetera, St. Paul, New York City, these are some of the places. Next slide, please. Employee B doesn't want to return to work because of child care issues. Um, and let's assume working remotely is not an option. Again, if it's because of summer school, daycare, or camp being closed due to the virus, and um, otherwise, it's a public employer, or, or at that time, the employee is under 500, then obviously they can be entitled, if they've not already used it, under the um, Family First Coronas Response Act. Also, again, check your state and uh, local municipalities, because sometimes leave is provided. For example, Philadelphia and Colorado provide leave in these circumstances. Um, and Florida does not require it. but you may end up with a disparate impact on females. So again, we suggest at this stage, phase one and phase two, that um, you be flexible. And we also suggest that if you're going to take any adverse action or contemplating it, that you discuss it with your legal counsel before doing so. Next slide, please. Employee C is concerned about bringing the virus home. Uh, perhaps to his children or to an elderly uh, parent who lives with him. Now, there's no obligation under federal law for the employer to accommodate the relatives or, or house guests of an employee. The employee must be accommodated, but not the ones that um, his dependents. Florida also has no requirements. However, you have to check your state and local laws again because various states 
do provide protection to the employee, Philadelphia being one. Uh, next slide, please. So some final thoughts. Um, on the written offer of recall, uh, we strongly recommend that you do spell out all the terms and conditions of employment, uh, that you outline in detail your safety plan and what's expected of the employee in participating in that safety plan or complying with it, that you also give employees a date to accept the recall, that you require the acceptance be in writing, and that you tell them the consequences if they don't accept by the designated date. We also recommend that you add that if, in fact, you are employment at will, that this does not change it, and that you provide a phone number if they have any questions. And for the private sector employers, um, be aware of maybe your responsibility under the WARN Act. Uh, if you're an employer of 100 or more and you had a reduction of 30% of your workforce for at least 50 people and the furlough is going to be six months or more, you may well be subject to, and probably are, the WARN Act. Now, here's the tricky part. You have to announce, uh, comply with the WARN Act notice as soon as you're aware of it, even if you cannot do it 60 days in advance. So depending on when you started your layoffs, by July 1st, if you're not sure that you're going to be able to recall a sufficient number of people that you don't comply, or excuse me, do not um, run into the WARN Act requirements, then you may want to speak with legal counsel about complying with that. Thank you very much, and Marta, back to you. Thanks so much, Susan, for educating us on the legal aspects of what employers should consider when adopting plans and revising procedures to reopen their offices. Finally, Laura will address the need for effective communications during this time as we reopen our workplaces. Thank you so much, Marta. Next slide, please. So as we look at where we are in the communications environment, it's important to level set because as a number of our panelists have mentioned, there are a lot of factors influencing how people are receiving and sharing communications right now. On the next slide, we'll see that a recent study has found that among institutions that may be responsible for responding to um, issues like coronavirus, there is no single organization that's considered both ethical and competent. So moving on to, yeah, this is fine. We can start with it. We can work on this slide. The other thing that's um, affecting how people are receiving information is this normalization of misinformation. So we've all seen the tidal wave of information that's come in about coronavirus and been privy to the fact that a lot of it is not correct. And there are a number of um, pieces of information that have been shared that have later been disproven or that have been speculative. And so that's creating a sense of distrust among communications um, across the board. Next slide. One of the ways we've seen the normal of mis normalization of misinformation is through normally trusted sources. So this is an example of a police department in the Midwest offering to methamphetamine users to come on into the police station and that they would be happy to test their drugs for coronavirus. Of course, the drugs, uh, coronavirus is not present in methamphetamines, but it was a way, for, obviously, for the police station to try and round up illegal drug users. And it became so prolific, next slide, across the country that the CDC ultimately reached out to law enforcement and had to ask them to stop doing it. So when we have normally trusted institutions like police departments intentionally spreading misinformation, it does create a little bit of um, confusion within the stakeholders and audiences we want to speak to. Mm -hmm. Next slide. The other challenge we have in this environment is something that we're calling irrational rationality. And essentially, people want to believe that they make decisions rationally, um, but the study after study has shown that we first make decisions emotionally and then we justify them rationally. And so because tensions are running high, because of all the anxiety that we spoke about earlier, there's this funny situation where we're trying to rationalize some ir irrational emotions, although they may have good cause. And so that's affecting the ability of people to hear, receive, and understand messages. Next slide, please. 
Also uniquely with the coronavirus and uniquely with where we are right now in time is we are dealing with a confluence of factors. So unlike previous crisis situations where we may have all been on the same page at the same time, that's not the case here. So people are coming at this from very different angles and for very different reasons. We're all trying to factor health and safety implications, logistical risks. We may be dealing with financial insecurities. There's a changing geographic impact on almost a daily basis. And of course, there's still unknown aspects of the virus. So all of this is making it challenging for us as communicators to cut through and make sure people are really hearing what we need them to hear. So going forward on the next slide, we'll look at five actionable communication strategies uh, very quickly and then get to questions. So the first of these strategies is a landscape analysis. Before jumping into any extensive communications initiatives, it's important to understand what's expected of us and what's happening in our space. So a quick internal survey to understand what leaders and employees are looking for, a quick look at competitors to see what is happening in your um, industry, and then a quick external look to understand the mindset and expectations of your customers, clients, partners, and others. The second um, uh, communication strategy is a future readiness plan. So this may be something that people put on the back burner because it doesn't seem as urgent, but it's important to do what we're calling planning for pandemic pandemic next. And essentially that's making sure you have a plan for spikes and future contagions because we're certain to see these. One way to do that is to look at the crisis communications plan you have in place and make sure that that plan includes those sorts of scenarios and also that it's refined based on what you've learned over the past few weeks. And then of course it's always important to couple your plan with a training program for both employees and executives. The third communication strategy is to then develop your return to work transition tools. So from there, looking at an external facing health and sanitation manual. As you put your policies together, it's necessary to have an external version of those because you will be asked. Vendors, partners, and others are going to want to know what you're doing if they're coming into your space. Looking at website and social media policies, looking at a cascade communication structure and an um, uh, and employing a health and safety pledge for employees are all also good um, tools to have in the toolkit. The fourth communication strategy is, a change, is change management training. And one of the things we know is that of all the change we've seen over the past few weeks, there's going to be continued change ahead. And so it's important to put change management training structures in place so that we're hiring and training for change, we're establishing de decision-making structures that are streamlined for change, and we're measuring our change capability so that we can ensure continuous improvement. The final strategy is to make sure that you've got an open for business marketing toolkit. And that can include lots of pieces that you've probably already started thinking about, but should definitely include things like your digital and social media assets and vehicles for capturing stakeholder feedback. If people are concerned, you need to give them a way to share that with you before they take to social media or pick up the phone and call the press. So lastly, a few go forward implications that we've thought about here um, for the next few months. Bill Gates said, I think earlier this week or last week, that what companies do from this point forward is going to be every bit as, if not more important than what they've done to date. So what we know is there is no steady state. Based on what's happening now, companies will emerge or in a better or worse position. So the communications goal is laying the groundwork for effective management, recovery and rebound. And as we think about what that looks like, the primary thing that needs to be at the forefront in communications and planning is that the long-term security of the organization is far more important than short-term expediency. So with that, I will turn it back over to Marta for questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate, Laura, your insights on the communication side of this type of a project. What I'd like to be able to do now is, is we've got a couple minutes left, and as I promised, we will send back our responses to all the questions we got on the FAQ, but we'll take a couple. And the one that we have here right now um, from Sherry Connor, um, it says, in a small company, how do you walk the line with not disclosing the name, but knowing who is missing by, who is missing from the team on a given day? Mariah, do you want to take that question? 
Sorry, I was in mute. <laughs> That's okay. So um, I think that Susan touched upon uh, keeping confidentiality. They may automatically uh, figure out, um, you know, who who um, uh, was either um, who was in, uh, uh, contracted the virus or not. But um, you know, the, I think the key is to communicate to the overall team. Um, you know, in regards to the fact that we need to keep confidentiality and, and not discuss other people's matters and, and keep it at that. I don't know, Susan, if there's anything else you want to add. I believe you touched upon it on the presentation as well. No, I, I think you just covered it. Yes, it may be obvious, but the employer cannot um, confirm it or acknowledge it. So we're going to go. Thank you very much to the to the answering that question. We're going to go to one more. Um, that came in from before from Gerald Buer. And the question was, is there any special treatment of employees coming back from uh, COVID hotspots from on vacation? Um, yes, you can ask them, you know, where they've been. And if they have been from a hotspot, I would have them quarantined. Quarantine. Unless they get a, uh, unless they decide to go for a test. Um, I think the air in this particular case is all focused on um, the direct threat to society, your workforce. So I would err on that side. Excellent. And if they can work from home, fine. But if they can't, I would have them out. Excellent. It's now 3.01 and we appreciate everybody's time. We elected not to do the polling questions because we figured the content was more important today. And we really appreciate you coming to our uh, our webinar and if you do have any more questions feel free to send them in and we'll be happy to send them out in an FAQ and we hope that you have good luck with opening your workplace in the future. Thank you very much and thank you to the panel for your presentations.